Okay, in this um, fourth video for the first week in Unit 4 of Calculus, we're going to talk about what's called derivative tests. And for our purposes, we have two of them. We'll call them the first derivative test and the second derivative test. Before we get there, let's just remind ourselves of uh, what it means to be an increasing function or a function that is increasing on a particular domain. Uh, this example here on the left, of course, we would consider as an increasing function. And by definition, we know that it's increasing because the function result at x2 is greater than the function result at x1 as long as x2 is greater than x1. So as long as x2 is on the right side, uh, we have to increase in order to move to the next level or you know to the y uh, value of the next coordinate um, also since we have an understanding of derivatives we would note that any position along this curve has a positive first derivative when we calculate the derivative at any one of these points that will be positive as indicated by the slope of the tangent line at each of those points and similarly we could say the same for a decreasing function um, x2, the y result at x2 is going to be less than the y result at x1 as long as x2 is on the right. And again, that shows a decreasing function because any coordinate on this line also has a negative first derivative. Now, uh, it's important to note uh, this because that helps us really solidify this first derivative test. We're saying that on a continuous function f on some interval between two numbers, a and b, or in this case, x1 and x2, um, is th if there's a critical point c in between those two endpoints, uh, and as long as f is differentiable on that interval, except, or I'm sorry, on, let me try that again. Uh, the function is differentiable everywhere within that interval, uh, except perhaps at C itself. So if, um, if the critical point uh, is identified as a position that does not have a derivative, that's okay. Critical points can do that. Uh, that position um, may not be differentiable. But every other uh, point on that continuous function within that range or within that interval will be differentiable. So as long as those criteria are met, then we'll note that when F prime changes from positive to negative, that means when we switch from an increasing uh, function to a decreasing function at the point C, so there's going to be some point C where that switch occurs, that transition, with C being a critical point, either the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative doesn't exist, then that position C is what we would consider a local maximum. Similarly, if f prime, our derivative change is signed from a negative to a positive value, that is, if the function itself changes from decreasing to increasing at a point c, at a critical point, then that position is going to be determined a local minimum. And if the first derivative does not change a sign, so let's say that uh, uh, the first derivative is positive, we come across a critical point, and th again, that's where the derivative doesn't exist or when the derivative is zero. But then the um, uh, first derivative continues being positive. Well, we may have reached just kind of a flat point in the graph or a corner in the graph, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that there is a maximum or a minimum point. So we would say that there is no extreme value at C. Now, in all of these cases, we're talking about local extreme values, not absolute extreme values. The extreme value theorem, EVT, from a couple videos ago helps us identify the location of um, absolute um, uh, maximum points and absolute minimum points. And we can incorporate that with this first derivative test, but that's not really the, the objective of the first derivative test. We'll talk a little bit more on that in just a few minutes. Before we actually use the first derivative test, I do want to double check our ability to interpret descriptions of a function. Um, we have a function here, f, but we don't know what that function is. We don't have an equation for it. But we know that this function is continuous, and it's continuous for all x values. 
from negative infinity to positive infinity, so all real numbers. And this function has the following conditions or characteristics. There are four of them here. I want to see if you can sketch a picture of this graph based on the four characteristics. Again, we have no idea what the equation is that generates or that, that this function is, is made from, but I think we could interpret the behavior of this graph and hence the behavior of this function based on these four criteria. So I'm going to challenge you right now. I'm going to ask that you pause the video and try to sketch this graph on the provided axis given these characteristics and resume playback in a moment to check your work. Here's a sketch that I've produced. Um, first thing that I did, you may notice, is um, I've got these little marks on our x-axis and I've also put these dotted lines extending above and below them. Uh, those marks just kind of reminded me of some of these interesting transition points that were identified in the problem. At 0, 4, and 6, um, something interesting occurred, and between um, criteria 1 and 2, we're, we're noticing that that's a change in our first derivative. So the first derivative was positive in this interval, and I put a little plus sign there to remind me of that. It's also positive on this interval from 4 to 6, and then again from 6 to infinity. And we didn't say that it's continuously increasing here because uh, bulleted point number four said that the first derivative at six precisely was equal to zero. The derivative was negative between the values zero to four, and so I marked that here. And that was just done before I even blew, or drew this blue line um, on the graph. It's just, again, a reminder as a guide as I'm generating the sketch. Now the last interesting characteristic was that f prime at zero was undefined. And if you recall, this notion of a derivative that's undefined happens in a couple different uh, scenarios. There could be a cusp or a corner in the graph, kind of like what we have here. Um, I would call this a corner. A cusp tends to be a shape that does this, where, um, um, where we almost make this wedge, if you will. So I would call this a corner, and, and that, of course, indicates that the derivative is undefined. Uh, we also have an undefined derivative at asymptotes, at holes, and jumps in the graph. But since this function was continuous, I knew that we wouldn't encounter an asymptote, a hole, or a jump. So I had to draw some sort of cusp or corner here. Now, your sketch doesn't have to be identical to mine, especially in the vertical positioning of it. In fact, the, th this particular sketch could have been drawn you know, above or below the x-axis entirely, and that would have been uh, just fine. But um, if you're not sure whether or not your sketch matches the four criteria, send me a picture of that or stop me in class, and uh, we can chat about it. Let's try the same thing on this example over here, number 11. There are fewer criteria components, and I think you'll be able to sketch this one now that we've seen this explanation. So pause the video now and resume playback in a moment to check your work. Now this sketch is probably going to be a bit more um, simple than the last. All that we were told was that the first derivative changes on different intervals from negative infinity to 2 in this uh, interval here, we had a uh, negative derivative, so the function had to be decreasing. And then again, from um, 5 to infinity, the function was also decreasing. We had a, um, a negative first derivative. And then in between, um, on the interval from 2 to 5, we ended up having a positive first derivative, so the function must be increasing. There was no mention of what's occurring at an x value of 2 or an x value of 5 precisely. So I went ahead and made the assumption that the first derivative was equal to 0. And that's how we've got these nice turning points. Of course, there could have been an undefined derivative at these locations as well. And you may have drawn, say, an asymptote. Uh, you could have curved up indefinitely here and here, although that would only work if the function was not continuous, and I just double-checked my instructions, and we were told that the function was continuous. So no asymptotes, but uh, if you had a sharp corner or a cusp, that likely would have been okay.
Now, uh, towards the end of the instructions, it says to use a number line to summarize information about the function. We're not going to do that for this example, but I will use it for this next example when we actually use the first derivative test. In general, when I perform the first derivative test, I'll try to do as much calculus and algebra as I can first, and then I'll use a geometric approach following the analysis on a number line. Let me show you what I mean. In part A, we're being asked to find the intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing, and then we will use those intervals to identify the local extrema. And remember, this extrema phrase is, uh, it means maximum and minimum points. So for part A, in order to find where the function is increasing and decreasing, we need a derivative. Now that's easy to do in this case because we have a polynomial function. So the derivative is going to be 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 12x plus 12. It's kind of interesting, but uh, that's what we've got. Now. I'm going to go ahead and use some algebra to simplify this. I know on our last test we didn't bother with this step, but moving forward as we actually analyze some of these functions, it will be a good idea to use some algebra skills to uh, simplify and, and uh, interpret the results. What I've done originally was I factored out a 12 that was acting as a common factor, and now I'm left with this four-term polynomial inside our grouping symbol. And within this four-term polynomial, I'd like to try to factor it some more. And one of the techniques that we use to factor a four-term polynomial is factoring by grouping. And within this first group, x cubed minus x squared, I see that x squared is our GCF. So I'll factor it out, and I'm left with x minus 1. In this second group, I see that 1 is our GCF, but I'm going to call that a negative 1 in order to change this coefficient sign. So we'll factor out a negative 1, and that leaves me with positive x and a minus 1. That was a good technique because now our groups here match, and if we're using the factor by grouping technique and we see a matching pair of binomials, then we know we can move on to the final step, and that's to rewrite this collection of terms in this way, where x squared and minus 1 form their own factor group, and the x minus 1, which is essentially a common factor between two terms, that produces its own factor group. Now, lastly, we want to make sure that we factor completely, and this looks pretty good, but this middle term here is a difference of two squares, so I better factor it. That's going to turn into x plus 1 and x minus 1. We also have the x minus 1 from the last term before. And finally, just to clean this up, one more step. This, is, this one's probably optional, but it's a nice way to tidy all of this up. Since we have two of these x minus 1 terms multiplied together, we'll call that x minus 1 squared. All right, so we found the first derivative. We factored it. We combined like terms. We really cleaned it up into a, a usable uh, component, and this is going to be particularly helpful for us because when we use the first derivative test to identify where the function is increasing and decreasing, you may recall that interesting components of the first derivative test re require critical points. So we were talking about that here, so critical points C. Now the critical points occur when the function's derivative is equal to zero or when the derivative doesn't exist. So at the very end here, I'm going to mark this derivative equal to 0, and I'm going to find all the critical points associated with that. And then I'm also going to just make a mental note here that since this is a polynomial, and polynomials are always defined for um, x values in the real number system, um, I know there are no other critical points because there's no other x values in the real world, or any real number x values, I should say, uh, that will make this solution not exist. So the only critical points we'll find is when the function is equal to 0. Since we've um, already factored this, then finding the points that make this 0 are going to be very easy. And I'll make a note that all critical points, so therefore all critical points, exist at x equals negative 1 from this factor and positive 1 from this factor. So I'll just say at all x equals um, I'm sorry, all of the critical points exist at the x values 1 and negative 1. And if it's worth adding into your notes, uh, this is what's going on in my head. All critical points exist when the derivative is equal to 0 or the derivative does not exist.
Okay, so we've got our preliminary work out of the way. Let's use that number line to identify characteristics about this graph. So I'm just going to draw a number line. Um, it's not real critical, the dimensions or the size of it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark on this number line our two critical points. We have negative 1 and positive 1. If there were critical points where the derivative did not exist, I would also mark those positions as well. What we're going to do, since we realize that the first derivative is equal to 0 here and here, is we're going to investigate what's happening in this region, this region, and this region. These three intervals that the uh, number line has been segmented into. And we'll determine what's happening in those regions by just selecting a point within that region. Um, a value that's selected in this section of the number line will represent the behavior of all points on that number line because we've already identified the only positions where the derivative is equal to zero, where our critical points exist. So since there are no more critical points anywhere else, then we know the behavior of that function is going to be consistent within that interval. So I'm going back to the original, sorry, the derivative function here. And I'm thinking, what numbers can I substitute into the derivative function? And I'm also using the factored form of this derivative function just because it's going to make the math a little bit easier. In fact, I don't think we'll have to do the math in, in its entirety. Um, we can probably just consider the signs that go with it. So a number that's to the left of negative 1 might be negative 2 or negative 3 or negative 5 or whatever. But if I pick the number negative 2 to investigate, then I can see what's happening with this particular expression. Well, if the number negative 2 is evaluated and I've got a product of essentially three terms, 4 if you count this square, um, this 12 is a positive number and this negative 2 plus 1 is a negative number and this negative 2 minus 1 is also negative but that negative value ends up being squared when we follow our order of operations so that becomes positive and the product of a positive negative and a positive number will end up being negative so I'm going to make a note here that in this interval to the left of negative 1 our first derivative is negative and that would be true for any x value in that region. Let's pick a number now that's in between negative 1 and 1. And I'm probably going to use the number 0 here. And I'm using different colors to make the math stand out. But now if I use the number 0 as a replacement, uh, we'll notice that, again, the number 12 is positive. We've got 0 plus 1, which is a positive value, 0 minus 1, which is negative, but that negative value becomes squared. And when you square a negative value, you end up with a positive result. Now, three positive numbers multiplied together will produce a positive result. So at this position, any value within this range, based on this singular test point, which is indicative, uh, shows us that the first derivative is always positive. Now lastly, if I choose one more data point, this time to the right of this final critical point, we've got 12 times something plus 1 times something minus 1 squared. Well, let's use a number like 2, since that's on the right side of 1. And I'm choosing nice numbers that I can perform some mental math with. Um, I don't want to pick any gnarly decimals unless I absolutely have to. The number 12 was positive. 2 plus 1 was positive, 2 minus 1 is positive, and a positive number squared also remains positive. So in this region, we're dealing with a positive result as well. So that tells me a lot about the behavior of this function, and we can actually answer question B right now. The first derivative test indicated that when the first derivative changes from a negative to a positive at a critical point, then we've reached a minimum value. So we can say that there is a, I'm going to call this a local minimum because we haven't executed the extreme value test, but there is a local minimum at the position where x is equal to negative 1. And we would know that there's a local maximum when the signs change from positive to negative. 
But that didn't happen here. We did not change from positive to negative. We just retained our positive slope on the left and the right-hand side of this critical point. So there are no other extreme values other than this minimum at x equals negative 1. I'm going to cheat a little bit and move my ink down a little bit lower, and um, we can probably sketch a graph. You can add this to your notes if you'd like, but at the very least, uh, pay attention here so that you can see what I'm about to do next. Sort of like what we did a minute ago with sketching graphs of, uh, based on characteristics of the function, I'm going to do the same here. I know that at negative 1, we had a first derivative that was equal to 0. And at positive 1, we had a first derivative that was equal to 0 as well. I also recognize that the function was decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1. We reached that low point, that minimum, because this is a position where our first derivative is 0. We had to create a function, excuse me, that was increasing up until an x value of positive 1. So we're going to increase and increase and increase, but level off because the derivative is equal to 0. But to the right of that point, we also have a positive first derivative. So I think it's going to continue to move upward. And again, you'll notice that we've got a minimum value here but not a minimum or maximum value here, even though that was identified as a critical point. And if you consider um, what this graph might have looked like based on it being a polynomial, we've got a positive leading coefficient with an even degree, so I would expect to see two tails pointing upward. And since it is a quartic, uh, there could be as many as three turns to it. So based on polynomial end behavior, we may have guessed that this is the shape of the function. Now with a bit of information from the first derivative test, we've got a, an idea of this being the function. Uh, moreover, we could consider our y-intercept as well and actually position this uh, blue graph more appropriately. I'm not sure if I can capture it here, but since the y-intercept is positive 1, well, the shape may look something more like this. Now, I have to resume this video in a moment because something's coming up on my calendar. Um, if you would, please, go ahead and um, consider this next example before you start the next video. Uh, the function that I'd like for you to apply this uh, set of instructions to is the function x squared divided by x squared minus 1. And we'll do this on the interval from negative 4 to positive 4. And with that, we can consider the extreme value theorem. The EVT will assist us with part C, where we identify the absolute maximum and minimum. So again, give this one a shot on your own. I'll resume this in the next video. Thanks for watching.